Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me up there? Yep. So thank you, Stefan, for this very nice introduction. And thank you all for having me here today. OK, so today uh, I wish to uh, discuss um, several aspects of physics beyond the standard model. OK, so let me begin by uh, just reminding you about the structure of the standard model. Um, we, we're in a unique place now with the discovery of the Higgs in that the structure for the very first time uh, is a unitary theory up to essentially arbitrarily high energies. So that, that means that you can compute scattering amongst any particles you like, and the scattering amplitudes make sense. You can go beyond this, and I'll include uh, the graviton, and then we can include gravity. And in this structure, it's not quite true anymore that the theory is unitary to arbitrarily high energies, but it's almost true. In fact, it's essentially unitary for lengths larger than a kind of unimaginably short distance, the so-called Planck length, which is the square root of h bar g newton over c cubed, and it's about 10 to the minus 35 meters. So if you stay away from that length, you have a consistent theory uh, internally, more or less. Um, and when I say you can throw in the graviton, just as a brief comment, uh, I mean that kind of seriously. You can, for fun, compute true quantum gravity corrections. The formulas don't matter, but I just want to highlight that you can do it, as people did some years ago. So real, honest to goodness, quantum gravity corrections. You can even have fun, as we did in some work, between gravitational polarizable objects. Again, true quantum gravity corrections can be computed. And this is the, yes. OK. So, oh, OK, no problem. So this is the sense in which one says general relativity, along with the standard model, is, is an effective theory up to these fantastically high energies. These corrections are fantastically small, and we cannot measure them on macroscopic scales, but it's there in principle. Now, the standard model, it's worthwhile organizing it by its various spins that take place. So a particular spin is also a particular representation of the Lorentz group. And so there are many of these different varieties that we know exist. If we, come, if we go from high spin down to low, it's in the following way. Okay, so the graviton is the spin two particle. And so that means that if you take any one of these particles, and it's say it's moving upwards, and you measure its spin along its direction, you'll get, in the case of the graviton, plus or minus two times Planck's constant. And it goes on from there. So we know there's a massless spin one particle, that's the photon. Massive spin one particles, the W and the Zs. And multiple interacting massless spin one, the eight gluons. And it goes on. There's a range of spin half particles, the quarks and the leptons. And these have all sorts of different charge assignments. Nature has basically chosen essentially all the possibilities. So some of them, like the left-handed quarks, have three different kinds of charges. Some of them have only two different kinds of charges. And some of them have only one, different, one kind of charge, such as the right-handed electron. And finally, the Higgs, as I mentioned, is the, sort of special because it's this spinless particle right there. And so we know that this picture here explains a fantastic range of phenomena. And essentially all phenomena in the lab, up to some corrections that may or may not be there, but a fantastically successful picture of the world. Now let me highlight some points that I will discuss today, which are puzzles beyond the standard model. And these are just five points that I find particularly interesting. 
There are many others you could add to the list. The first two points I will only mention briefly, and in some sense I'll spend more time on points three, four, and five. So cosmological acceleration, neutrino masses, reheating the universe, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. I'll explain what I mean by the strong CP problem. And then the final point, we're probably all familiar with the idea of dark matter. Now, to set the stage, let me mention that there's, if you like, two perhaps approaches you could take to physics beyond the standard model, regardless of what your motivation happens to be. A kind of radical approach would be to violate one or more of the known principles of nature. Okay, so you could summarize the basic principles in as perhaps three. The first being that I've listed is locality. And that I mean to say that there is no instantaneous signaling from one point in space to another. There's a bunch of space-time symmetries, the so-called Poincaré group of symmetries, which are the Lorentz transformations, along with rotations, and translation invariants the symmetry group of special relativity, if you like. And then finally, we could summarize quantum mechanics as saying that states should evolve unitarily. So the states evolve and they preserve their norm in some Hilbert space. And they evolve in a relatively boring way. They evolve linearly. That's the linearity of the Schrodinger equation. So I'll just spend maybe two or three minutes just giving you a flavor of the kind of things that happen if you start messing with these principles. And then we'll move on to a different strategy after that. So to give you a flavor, what happens if you give up the linearity of quantum mechanics? It's a fun thing to think about. So for example, these two terms here would constitute the standard uh, Schrodinger equation. I d d t of the wave function is the Hamiltonian operator acting on the wave function. That's the Schrodinger equation, which is consistent with all observations. And then you could imagine adding all sorts of other terms to this thing. So I've introduced some new operators, O1 and O2, whatever they might be. And I've sandwiched O1 in some state, the same state psi. And so this correction here is nonlinear because it involves multiple copies of psi. And you could imagine all sorts of higher order corrections to that. Now, such a thing is very tightly constrained experimentally, to be sure. But very interestingly, going back some 30 years to Gissen and Polchinski, they pointed out that there's something very bizarre going on in this theory. So you can already get a clue that something funny might be going on with locality if you look at this term here. So if you were to study this thing in its position basis, so think of psi as a function of position, to find out what the wave function is doing here, I somehow am supposed to do an integral over all space. That doesn't sound very local. And these authors pointed out we can be even more concrete when we think about entangled pairs. And as, we, as Einstein pointed out, entanglement has, is what he called spooky action at a distance. And as we teach all of our students, spooky action at a distance does not allow you to signal. But in nonlinear quantum mechanics, it does. It leads to real action at a distance. So the linearity of quantum mechanics seems to be tightly connected to the assumption of locality. So let me just illustrate one other point briefly, which is what happens if you give up Lorentz boost invariance. So imagine that there were a preferred frame. Let's be very naive for a few minutes. OK, so to illustrate this, let's start with this is the Lagrangian of quantum electrodynamics. If you're not familiar with Lagrangians for fields, don't worry. But this is just something that's helpful for me to point to and illustrate the point. So this first term is essentially the kinetic term of the photon. Uh, then this is the kinetic term of the electron and the positron. And buried inside of this capital D here is some coupling between the electron and the photon. Now, in all of these other funny symbols floating around, this eta mu nu and gamma mu, all that's relevant is that they govern the kinematics of these particles. So this eta mu nu here has factors of c in it, and that's the speed of light. And this gamma that governs the kinematics of the electron also is related to c. And so the electron satisfies the famous 
relativistic energy momentum relation. The electron knows about C just as much as the photon does. Well, if you wanted to, for fun, you could give up the Lorentz symmetry very easily at the level of pen and paper. You could just declare that the kinematics of the electron is governed by a new speed that I called C sub E for electron. And if these two speeds are different numbers, you've violated Lorentz invariance. This theory is still perfectly local. You cannot send signals instantaneously. The maximum speed of propagation is the maximum out of C and CE, which I'm assuming are finite numbers. To be sure, this is fantastically constrained experimentally as well. But interestingly, uh, well, let me just highlight, yes, I mentioned to you this theory is local. And I just want to make a point. You don't have to pay too much attention to this equation. But suppose you had some charges on the left and some charges on the right, and you want to compute the force, the electric force between them. The way the theory has to conspire to be local is a very interesting way. In some sense, it exchanges the vector potential of electromagnetism and the Coulomb potential, and they conspire against each other to make everything local. And it works only if current is conserved, that is to say you have a conserved charge very easy to picture why that's true. If I had charge here and it suddenly disappeared, there would be an electric field at some distance that would suddenly change and you could send a signal with this. It would be non-local. So even without Lorentz, but you demand no instantaneous signaling, the photon still demands a conserved charge and an associated symmetry. You can extend this, as some people did some 20 years ago, to the whole standard model. And there are many ways you can give up Lorentz symmetry. And the structure is local and unitary. And it has exactly the same number of degrees of freedom of that chart that I began with in the talk on slide number two. It's the same number of particles. Now you can ask what happens if you include our friend the graviton. And things change. So there you have to have various pieces conspire in order for the gravitational force to also be local if we stick to that principle. And just like the photon demands a symmetry and a conserved charge, so too it turns out that the graviton to make this conspiracy local also demands that something is conserved. And in this case, the associated symmetry is exactly that of the Lorentz boosts. So it has this universal character, just like the graviton couples universally. So I don't want to tell you that it's impossible to give up any of these basic principles. But I do say that it's quite difficult to introduce small violations, small deformations in some consistent way, either experimentally or even theoretically. In Weinberg's uh, popular book, Dreams of a Final Theory, he called this idea rigidity. It's difficult to deform the laws. In any case, for the remainder of this talk, I will discuss a more, if you will, conservative approach to move beyond the standard model. So let's say we write down, so this is some action. So this thing here, this script R thing, is called the Ricci scalar. And if you were to vary this action and write down the equations of motion, this gives you the Einstein field equations. Okay, so this is the so-called Einstein-Hilbert action. And this L sub SM just is my notation for the Lagrangian of the standard model. Okay, so this is modern physics summarized for you. All right, so let me say something then about this first point on cosmological acceleration. So we probably all know that if you look at the energy contents of the universe today, to describe the current acceleration of the universe, to feed that into Einstein equations, you should introduce something called the dark energy. And perhaps the simplest thing you could do is to add a, a so-called cosmological constant, this thing I called capital lambda. If you set units where h bar and c is equal to 1, its value to fit the data is about a milli electron volt to the 4. OK? Now, in fact, some people would have the point of view that this isn't even going beyond the standard model. Because you might say, well, why shouldn't you include lambda? Why isn't that just part of the theory from the get-go? So in some sense, this term, this coupling, if you will, is allowed. 
And you might say whatever's not forbidden is mandatory, so there it is. End of story. Well, we don't know if it's the end of the story, but I, it's worth perhaps pointing out that there's a technical sense in which it goes beyond the existing principles, which is that the moment you have lambda, the symmetries of space-time are not exactly what we thought they were. Remember I told you all of physics is built upon these symmetry, these uh, principles, including the Poincaré group. And indeed it's true that if you take this thing here, even though it's not emphasized as much, it, re it really is, if there's no lambda, it really does have the Poincaré symmetry, despite all the curved space-time. So what do I mean by that? I mean it in the same sense you mean it in electromagnetism. If you have an orbiting black hole here, full-blown GR, right? And you compute the gravitational waves from it. Now you boost this thing under a Lorentz boost. It goes like this. Now you collect the gravitational waves from it. What does the theory predict? Predicts they're Doppler shifted. Boring old special relativity formula. So it's Poincaré invariant. And the moment you have lambda, that's not quite true anymore, but it has a similar symmetry structure, the so-called de Sitter group. Now we should remember that over 100 years ago, we also went through such a kind of revolution, perhaps more important than that one. Of course, relativity was not discovered by Einstein. It was discovered by Newton and Galileo. And Newtonian mechanics is built upon a 10-parameter Galilean group of symmetries, which Einstein and Lorentz and Poincaré deformed into the Poincaré group by the introduction of a new parameter C. And so in some sense, this has a similar spirit. You are lifting this to a new group as well with a second parameter lambda. So that might just be the way it is. I might add, though I'm not going to elaborate on this point, but famously it's been notoriously difficult to embed a, cosmo a positive cosmological constant in some ideas in fundamental physics, such as string theory, or in particular it's been difficult in string theory. And there's old work on this, I shamelessly promoted this paper I wrote some years ago, where we found a big swath of the so-called landscape do not have positive lambda. But this is a big ongoing topic. So in any event, I want to turn essentially my attention for the rest of this talk to the standard model Lagrangian, which is this thing here. Well, that's a technical question. Yes. Um, is there any reason to think that we might need to, when going back to promoting this lambda and GR, this, uh, this maybe reform also that the Young Guy energy, so this normally is not right, it would change. The Young Guy energy. Deform the Bianchi identities in GR. But I mean, are you giving up this action here? No, I'm not I'm going to keep the action, but I want to. We can talk after that. Maybe, yeah. Let's discuss after so I understand better your idea. Okay, so here's the standard model Lagrangian. Again, if you're not familiar with Lagrangians of fields, this might look a little scary. But again, it's something useful for me to point to. So this is essentially just the kinetic terms for the photons, the WZs, and the gluons. This is the kinetic term for the quarks and the leptons, and indeed their charges. This is a term that involves the gluons GG dual that I'll talk about later. We can put that aside for now. This is the kinetic term for the Higgs. This is a potential function for the Higgs, H, which has this minus mu squared H squared. This is the thing that famously gives rise to the so-called Mexican hat potential and spontaneous symmetry breaking so to speak. And this is the term that couples the Higgs to the fermions and endows them with a mass. Now, these, this Lagrangian here, on the one hand, is locked in uniquely. It has various parameters, some of which the mu's and lambdas you see, and other parameters are hidden in my notation. But it's locked in in the sense that this is the total set of things you can write down if you stick to the following two points. One is you stick to the degrees of freedom, that table of particles I mentioned at the beginning, the picture that we've all seen a thousand times. And the other assumption is that I stick to so-called dimension four operators. What does dimension four mean? At a practical matter, it means what I said at the beginning. If you take any of these particles and you smash them at each other, their scattering amplitudes remain well behaved to arbitrarily high energies modulo the funniness with the graviton at the Planck scale. 
Or said differently, a related idea is that this thing is said to be renormalizable, which means that un quantum mechanically it's self-contained. You don't have to add a bunch of other corrections to it. So uh, what many people would consider a conservative approach is to either give up these two things, to add higher dimension operators, and or to add new degrees of freedom, add new particles. So let me illustrate that in the case of neutrino masses. So this is a point that I've not personally worked on, but I find the example so beautiful that I, have, I will mention it because I think it helps to set the stage for what I'll talk about later. So if we look at the fermions of the standard model, I told you that they have many different charge assignments. And furthermore, they're all what's known as chiral. So that means that a left-handed particle and a right-handed particle, say a left-handed electron and a right-handed electron, have different charges. They all have this property. And when you have different charge assignments to left and right, you can't fundamentally write down a mass term from some microscopic point of view. Nevertheless, many of them acquire a mass famously through their coupling to the Higgs. But the neutrino is the exception that its chiral charge assignments are so restrictive that you can't even hand it, it a mass through a direct coupling to a standard type of coupling to the Higgs. So it remains massless. Now, observations tell us that the neutrino mass is small but non zero, around 0.1 eV. The fact that I just told you that the neutrino masses should be zero according to the standard model, if you think about it, is actually good. Because if your zeroth order analysis spits out zero, that's a very good position to imagine perturbing your theory to get something slightly non zero. And that can be done famously with this so called Weinberg operator which is a dimension five operator of the standard model. That's the first thing you could add beyond dimension four. And it's some operator that involves some leptons talking to the Higgs by this term, Ls and Hs. And since it's dimension five, dimensional analysis tells us it has to be suppressed by some scale that I called capital M as units of mass. Empirically, this mass M must be very big because we've never directly seen this effect. And plausibly, it's huge, maybe associated with some physics at some super high scale. Well, you can just crank the handle, and then you find, actually, it's pretty easy to just substitute H by V, the electroweak scale, doesn't matter. The neutrino mass gets perturbed to this small number here, which is plausibly this if M is big enough. You see, the neutrino mass is inversely proportional to this new scale of physics. From a microscopic point of view, this is implemented. This, so this business about adding higher dimension operators is just a fancy, a, a useful way at low energies of talking about something that is complete at high energies involving dimension four operators. That would be a complete theory, or a UV complete theory, as it's called. Now, I already mentioned to you that there are many charge assignments. Some particles have three. Some particles have two charge assignments. Some particles have one. A priori, it seems plausible that there might be particles out there that have no charge assignments at all. And such particles are called, or such fermions are called sterile fermions. They may exist, why not? Of course, we would not have seen them yet in the lab. They're so damn difficult to detect if they are indeed completely neutral. And if you have no charge assignment, then furthermore, you're not chiral and nothing prevents you from having a gigantic mass. So these new particles may well be neutral and super heavy. What can you do with such a thing? Well, it can couple to the Higgs in this way, this sterile fermion I called S, and this is precisely the thing that spits out this neutrino mass. So a priori, I think this is plausible that this is how these things work. Again, this is a very old idea, by the way. This business of appealing to particles that might have no familiar charges, and that it has some success for the neutrinos masses, makes, I think, the proposition of dark matter extra plausible. So the dark matter, whatever it is, presumably is built out of other new particles with very small interactions with the standard model and perhaps no charge assignments whatsoever. Again, why shouldn't they exist? 
So let me say something about what I'll refer to as the reheating of the universe. So let's continue down our merry path here of going from high spin to low. So one word about spin one particles. Okay, so you know that there's several massless spin one particles, the photon and the gluons. Okay, so you might wonder, why are they massless? <laughs> why is the photon massless? The short answer would be that no one really knows, but the plausible answer is because a massless photon has a different number of degrees of freedom than a massive photon. One is two and one is three. Why is that interesting? That's interesting because if you have a particle that only has two degrees of freedom instead of three, you are allowed to study that object that has only two degrees of freedom. In other words, you can decide this is my phase space, this is my Hilbert space, and I study it. It's in that sense no different from saying I choose to study three generations of quarks and leptons instead of four or ten. I'm allowed to study three, and so I'm allowed to study a massless photon because it's protected by its degree of freedom counting. Well, I mentioned briefly to you that the fermions are also protected by these funny charge assignments. Some are massless to leading order the neutrinos, and some have small but non-zero masses. But then there's a scalar, a spin zero particle, so-called scalars. And none of these arguments work for them. There's no obvious rationale why they should be light. There's no degree of freedom counting or chirality argument as to why they should be light. Well, we only know about one of them, and that's the Higgs. Its mass is 125 GeV. And why is it alone? Well, maybe there are, in fact, many other scalars that exist in nature. And as I said, unlike spin one or spin half, their mass is not a small mass doesn't buy you anything at first sight. So they may all just be very heavy without any altered basic structure of the theory. Now, do these heavy scalars, if they exist, we have no direct reason why they shouldn't, can they buy us anything? Are they useful? What's the point of adding super heavy stuff that we can't detect in the lab? Well, one perhaps extraordinarily important consequence could be the idea of cosmic inflation, which may be driven by one or more scalars, uh, of which I'll call it the inflaton. So again, I apologize Googling and inserting a picture that we've all seen before, but it's okay. So cosmic inflation, if it took place, was a period of cosmological acceleration, except it would have happened with orders of magnitude higher expansion rate than what we observe in the universe today. It could not have been driven by a pure cosmological constant because then it would have just persisted forever. We need it to end. So it has to be associated with something dynamical. And it turns out that a scalar can provide that. Now, as you can see from this picture, we don't just have to have inflation happen and it ends. It then has to dump its energy and fill the universe with the known particles we all see around us. So if we come back to the standard model of particle physics, it has one very unique feature, which is this thing here, this h squared term. So I told you that these operators are all kind of special because they're dimension four. But there's one and only one operator that's less than dimension four, and that's this one, h squared. It's dimension two. This one is extremely important. It's the one that gives rise to symmetry breaking and endows particles with masses. But it presents what seems to me a very useful opportunity for the inflaton and inflation to dump its energy into the world around us. Because if you stick to, theor to complete theories, that's theories built out of renormalizable interactions, precisely because you can write down h squared, if there's an inflaton, I'll call it phi, I can write down both a dimension three and a dimension four operator phi h squared and phi squared h squared. And if you like, it's the statement that you could have inflatons decaying into Higgses and annihilating into Higgses. Now this is perhaps very important because, okay, so here's the pie chart of the universe where at most four or five percent is ordinary matter and 95% or so is some dark material. <coughs> 
But I want to emphasize that this picture here is true at a given snapshot in time, namely today. And it was not true in the past. If you go back to when the universe was about one minute old, during Big Bang nuclear synthesis, where the primordial elements were produced, then the percentages were radically different. Okay, so back then, we know that the amount of material that was dark was, is bounded to be at most about 4%, or you get the primordial elements slightly wrong. So back then, our universe was almost all standard model, primarily photons and neutrinos. Now, if you take this kind of philosophy that I've been kind of suggesting, whatever's not forbidden is mandatory, why not just start adding new particles out there? So why shouldn't there be some dark photon or dark gluons and all sorts of things out there? Why not? Well, if that were true, it sounds very bad because maybe the inflaton dumps its energy into that sector instead of this gigantic sector, which is the standard model, which we know happened if inflation took place. So a speculative point of view would be that these other sectors have scalar masses in them that are all natural. I told you, scalars a priori have no reason to be light. They could just be incredibly heavy. So all these other sectors might look standard model-like with fermions and scalars and all sorts of stuff. But all those scalars may be super heavy. Why not? And if that's the case, the inflaton will struggle to decay into those sectors and will primarily decay into the Higgs via these interactions I mentioned. So I don't have time to go into the details, but you can compute various bounds on what these parameters should look like to efficiently reheat our universe. If the coupling, if depending on the value of the inflaton mass and the strength of the coupling, in some regime you can have an instability take place. In some regime the theory messes with unitarity, but there's a big plausible parameter space in which things work out just right. So, okay, very good question. So in this regime, it's all, the, the, there can be parametric resonance, but it doesn't change this regime in which everything is, where, where the theory is consistent. Um, and then depending on the inflot, if the inflaton mass is rather large, it looks like there's nothing allowed, it's all unstable, and then the second coupling, it turns out, can help, and there's an allowed regime there. So in any case, I do want to say that the Higgs seems to give us a unique opportunity to explain why we are radiation, standard model radiation dominated in the early universe. So let me turn to this next point. And I, to motivate it, I want to again come back to this discussion about the kinds of particles that might exist a priori. Okay, so I just said, if we talk again about scalars, that a priori they have no reason to not just be super heavy, it would seem. And then they may be relevant to inflation and so on, fine. But perhaps even more interesting might be, what about other particles that might exist that are very light that we can go and search for in the lab? Okay, so maybe there shouldn't be any such scalar by this rationale. Can we have very light, massless or nearly massless scalars? Okay, so here's a Lagrangian for a scalar, I'll call it A. A, a minute ago it was five, and now I'm calling it A, because it's light, I don't know. Here's its kinetic term, and if it has a mass, this is its mass term. M sub A would be its mass. Now, if you want this thing to be light, you need to come up with a rationale as to why its mass is small, or zero, better yet. So if you just stare at this thing, you realize there's one and only one opportunity, really. You have to invoke a new symmetry that you dream up. And that symmetry is to declare that the theory is invariant under a so-called shift symmetry, where you take the field A and you shift it to itself plus a constant A naught. Let's imagine the theory comes equipped with this symmetry. Well, if it does, then the kinetic term is fine because that involves derivatives. So the derivatives don't see this new piece. But this new term will be ruined by this symmetry. So if you impose the symmetry, you must set ma to zero. 
and hence the particle must be massless. Now, I just told you that it seems very good that the inflaton could couple to the Higgs through these kinds of operators. But if you're appealing to a light scalar and you're appealing to a shift symmetry, that very same argument tells you you can't even couple to the Higgs like this. And this means that such a light scalar cannot couple to the standard model period at the dimension four level. So this on the one hand is good because this would explain why we currently have not detected these things. Remember, they sound super easy to produce. They're massless or nearly massless. So we can easily produce them all the time. We don't need some high energy collider to do that. But precisely for that same reason that makes their mass small, they cannot couple it seems. And so they're compatible with experiment. But that sounds very boring because how would we know that this thing is there? Well, life doesn't end at dimension four. There can be dimension five operators, as I said before. And you might search through all possible dimension five operators and ask, can it couple at that level? And the answer turns out to be yes. So here's a couple of couplings. So here's this new field A, this light scalar. And this is, say, the photon. And I wrote F me nu, F me nu twiddle. So that twiddle is some dual tensor. But if you write it out, it's in fact just the dot product of the electric and magnetic fields. This is a good Lorentz invariant quantity that you can include. Now this term also looks like it breaks this shift symmetry because I have an A sitting there. But it turns out that this term F, F dual is actually a total derivative. And since it's a total derivative, secretly, if you integrate by parts, it obeys a shift symmetry. So you have to trust me on that. So at the classical level, at least, this is shift invariant. And you can also couple it to the gluons through G, G dual, where those are the gluon fields. Now this brings us, let me mention then, the so-called strong CP problem. So there was this one operator, if you recall, in the standard model Lagrangian that I pushed aside. So let's talk about it now. So you can, from the very get-go, include a term GG dual, where those are the gluon fields, and it has some coefficient, it's just a number, let's call it theta. And this term breaks, well, it's E dot B, so you can check that violates parity, and it indeed violates CP. But we haven't seen this term in any experiment, and so its coefficient theta is constrained to be very small, something like 10 to the minus 10 or so. And that's called the strong CP problem. This term is also unique in the standard model. All other parameters of the standard model have been detected in the regime where we could have plausibly have detected them. The only ones that are still difficult to detect, if you like, are some parameters in the neutrino sector. But they're almost certainly there, I would say. But this one could have easily shown up, and it has not. Now, furthermore, you can compute what's called the vacuum energy of QCD, so just how much energy is sitting there in the vacuum. And it turns out that the vacuum energy is minimal if theta is zero, the point which respects CP invariance. And if you break CP, it turns out the vacuum energy responds to that a little bit. In any case, you get this cosine function, which is minimized when theta is zero, approximately. I mean, it's, this is the approximate form. So now let's suppose, again, that maybe there is this light scalar that exists that's organized by a shift symmetry. OK, so again, the point of view might be that there could be hundreds of scalars out there in nature. 90% of them are super heavy because there's no reason for them to be light. And, but maybe one or more happens to be organized by a shift symmetry. Then we can write this thing down. And I just told you you could write down AGG dual because it secretly enjoys shift symmetry. And then the coefficient of GG dual, I can put these two things together. There's the new field, let's give it a name, we'll call it the axion, and this other coupling theta. And then it's at least, a, this isn't the exact formula, but it's good enough to illustrate the point. The vacuum energy is updated in a very simple way from cos theta to cosine theta of this new argument. Now this is interesting. 
because now the argument of the cosine is, is a dynamical, involves a dynamical field, the axion A. And so whatever this number was in the very early universe, what happens when the universe expands? When the universe expands, things tend to dilute. Their energies of things tend to go towards zero. And furthermore, fields tend to relax towards zero, or at least the configuration that minimizes their energy. So under cosmic expansion, the field, this axion, will roll to minimize this potential and sit near the bottom. And that will explain why the effective theta is very small. So that's the famous axion solution to the strong CP problem. I might just add parenthetically that this all, however, appeals to what seems a very ad hoc thing to do, which is to introduce this shift symmetry in the first place. And it's worth bearing in mind that that's really not how the standard model as we know it works. The standard model has various symmetries and they're all locked in by consistency. Like the photon has to couple to a conserved charge by locality, things like that. So this seems very ad hoc compared to that. But there are other symmetries in the standard model which seem ad hoc, like a symmetry associated with the conservation of baryon number. But this comes out for free. It's a so-called accidental symmetry. And there exists microscopic versions of this, or UV completions, in, in which this, what appears as an ad hoc symmetry, comes out for free. So that may be the way it is. Now let me say something then about dark matter for the remaining part of this talk. So again, I think this philosophy again suggests that there being particles in the universe that have small interactions with the standard model is a priori plausible. We shouldn't, we have no good reason to think that they just simply should not be there in the first place. And of course we back that up with real evidence. And on large scales, there's tremendous evidence for dark matter from cosmic microwave background, large scale structure, baryon acoustic oscillations, Lyman alpha forest, galaxy clustering, and they put together a kind of so-called concordance model where the data fits together very nicely. Now, this is on large scales, and let me mention briefly that on smaller scales, things are not so clean and well put together. And small to a cosmologist means about the scale of a galaxy. Okay, so some have argued that there's a problem in what's in the so-called baryonic Tully Fisher relation. So what's that? That's a relation between the observed baryonic mass of a galaxy and its asymptotic rotation velocity. In simple cold dark matter analyses, it suggests that the scaling should be here with mass proportional to velocity cubed. But the data lies here with mass proportional to v to the 4. OK, so there's been a, let's call it novel approach, to try to address this. And how does that work? That involves modifying gravity. Let's suppose you played that game. which You probably all heard that this was a, an attempt that has existed. So in standard gravity, or Newtonian gravity, the acceleration we all know is mass divided by distance squared. But if instead, following Milgram, you suppose that once you get out of the solar system and you get all the way to the scale of a galaxy, the force law radically changes. And it changes such that the acceleration is now proportional to the square root of this thing. So it involves a square root of mass and then in an overall 1 over r left over, so a 1 over r force. If you equate that to its centripetal acceleration, v squared over r, you see the r's cancel and you get mass proportional to v to the 4, which matches the Tully-Fisher relation. OK, so <laughs> that sounds fine. How might you do this with a theoretical construction? So you need a new attractive 1 over r force instead of 1 over r squared. Now in this framework of relativistic quantum mechanics, forces are always mediated by particles. And the only new thing that can mediate an attractive force other than the graviton is a scalar. 
So you need a scalar mediator, but it has to have peculiar interactions, as I'll describe to spit out 1 over r type of force. So let me say a couple of words about that. So here's, if you like, standard dynamics of a more or less regular scalar. So it has a kinetic term, and you have to couple it to matter somehow. And then you could draw a little diagram for how it mediates a force. If you take this Lagrangian invariant, here's the equation of motion. This is in standard dynamics. The wave operator acting on a field is given by a source. If your sources are slowly varying, or let's say static, your wave operator becomes the Laplacian operator, and this becomes the Poisson equation. And we all know the Poisson equation leads to a 1 over r squared force law. So that's standard. So if you want something else, you have to do something very peculiar. You can imagine lifting the kinetic term to some function of d phi squared. Imagine you cook that up. It's technically Lorentz invariant. You can do this. If you write down the corresponding wave equation, it becomes some nonlinear wave equation uh, equated to some source. And by your appropriate choice of function, you can basically spit out more or less whatever, whatever force law you like. So if you want a 1 over r force for Mondian dynamics, there is a corresponding function that will do that for you. But now here comes the rub. Is that a phrase? <laughs> OK. Um, sorry? Mm. The rub is the following. So if we go back to our regular wave equation, so you know that when you solve a wave equation, this is a relativistic wave equation, its perturbations propagate at speed c. So if you come along and start changing the dynamics because you don't want 1 over r squared, you want something else, and you alter the wave equation, you run the risk that you will generically modify the speed at which perturbations move at. They're not going to move at c anymore. Well, there's a chance they'll move at less than c, and that's OK. But there's also a chance they'll move at bigger than c, and then you're in trouble. And indeed, you can show that if you want a force law that goes like 1 over some power r to the p with p less than 2, such as p is equal to 1 for Mondian dynamics, that's precisely the regime where perturbations propagate faster than c. And so those are superluminal perturbations, which are generally considered disallowed in a fundamental theory, that's Lorentz invariant. So this kind of analysis goes back to lots of old work, going back even to the 60s, on this kind of analysis, but here in a particular context of um, galactic rotation curves was revisited relatively recently, and in some particular context uh, that I won't go into right now, we revisit this idea recently. So this is, I think, one good reason why it is that the proposal of dark matter most of us take so very seriously. It's the conservative approach. Can axions that I introduced be the dark matter? So we said that this axion has the property that it essentially rolls towards the bottom of this potential, and then it solves the strong CP problem. The effective theta is incredibly small. But it doesn't actually just roll to zero and stop there. It's a dynamical field. You let something roll in a potential, and it rolls down and it oscillates. As the universe expands, its oscillations are damped, but they don't become exactly zero. So it stores energy density in these oscillations. And in fact, it acts as a form of dark matter. And furthermore, it is indeed neutral and approximately stable. The potential for the axion is certainly lifted from zero. That's the big deal. So it has, in fact, a slightly non-zero mass. There's a mass that you try to kill with a shift symmetry. Quantum mechanically, it turns it back on, and it turns on a very tiny mass. The mass for the axion ends up being, like the neutrinos, inversely proportional to some high scale f. So this is the scale that sets those dimension 5 operators, like the scale coupling to the gluons. So axions are expected to be extremely light, even much lighter than a neutrino. And there, if you tailor expand this potential, there can, there's expected to be a quartic term, which is typically negative, though not guaranteed. 
in simple models, the relic abundance of the axion, which if it is the dark matter, should be about 25% of the universe, uh, scales with the initial value of the field in the early universe squared, and then it has some depend non-trivial dependence on this scale of new physics f. Okay, yeah, I guess I should stop soon, right? All right. You can have all sorts of fun putting constraints on the axion. So here's a constraint that involves both uh, the axion parameter f, the scale of new physics, or equivalently its inverse mass m, and the scale of inflation, if indeed both of these things are correct. There's a whole regime that's ruled out from predicting fluctuations in the CMB that we have not seen, the so-called isocurvature fluctuations, but there's a, there's a particular window that I can focus on called the classic window. In this window, the axion's initial configuration in the early universe is kind of interesting. So this is a cartoon of what it could have looked like in the early universe. It's essentially, more precisely, it's basically white noise fluctuations from one beyond the Hubble scale at early times, which is a very short distance back then. And it undergoes, therefore, essentially order one fluctuations from one Hubble patch to the next. So this is very inhomogeneous on these relatively small scales. If you count the number of axions that is inside of one of these oscillations, in a, in, inside of a wavelength, if you like, for standard axion parameters, it's somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to the 60 or so for the QCD axion. So its occupancy number is gigantic. When you have scalars at extremely high occupancy, they are ordinarily very well described then by their super quantum from the particle point of view, but they're really classical from the field theoretic point of view. So you can just study classical field theory. Objects at high occupancy with sufficient interactions tend to, as you learn in your stat mech, tend to organize into a Bose-Einstein condensate. Gravity is essential here, so that so-called condensate is an ax so-called axion star. It's a blob of axions held together by gravity. And there are related things known as mini-clusters, and these things may persist and exist in the galaxy today, and there's been lots of work on this idea over the years. Okay, so these structures might provide a kind of outside-the-box way of going after whether or not axions uh, exist in other dark matter. You can study the solution space of, uh, for these stars. This is their radius in some funny units as a function of the, the number or the mass of the star, in, again, in some funny units. And there's a branch of solutions here, which this blue branch is stable against perturbations. Good, <laughs> thank you. So the typical mass, it depends on your choice for the axion mass. A fiducial value is in the ballpark of 10 to the minus five electron volts. This gives you the relic, correct relic abundance in the most vanilla cosmic histories. And that corresponds then to a mass for these stars of about 10 to the 19 kilograms or the moon mass. And their radius is on the order of 100 kilometers. That's sufficient to get this result, that's right. Now the solution space grows, you get a maximum mass here and then it disappears. Intriguingly, the maximum mass can be relaxed um, if the interactions between the axion, the lambda a to the four term is actually repulsive and there exist concrete constructions that, for example, Gigi Fan developed recently. For, <laughs> and in this case, the, bran the stable branch of solutions just keeps on going to heavier and heavier masses. Now, I don't have much time, but I do want to say something else about a, perhaps a second puzzle in that dark matter faces. And that's the so-called core cusp problem. So when we look at the centers of galaxies, we find that the centers have cores, and their core is on the order of a kiloparsec or so. 
And in simple sort of vanilla dark matter models, simple simulations give you a cusp. So there seems to be a discrepancy there. And that's the so-called core cusp problem. And these points here are data from this paper of this is not the core's profile. I have to emphasize each dot is one galaxy. And it is a measure of the core density or just the maximum density at the center of the galaxy. And this axis is its characteristic wavelength, uh, a characteristic radius. Okay, so say it's full width half maximum, something like this. And you see there's some scatter, but it has this scaling. And if you fit a power law to it, rho core goes like 1 over r core to some power beta, it's approximately fit by beta near 1. Now, it's been suggested that these axion stars can do something for you, can explain this, if the axions are not the QCD axion, but are really light axions, so-called ultralight axions. If you make them light enough at the level of 10 to the minus 21 EV or so, and again, maybe there's a shift symmetry to justify this. Then they have a de Broglie wavelength that's so gigantic, it can be kiloparsec. So that's a, a, a proposal that's somewhat popular. But the kind of scaling that I mentioned suggests something else is going on. So we took a kind of critical approach to this relatively recently. These solution branches can be plotted. You can transform to these density versus radius coordinates. The stable branch that I mentioned has a scaling that's more like 1 over r to the 4. If you have a repulsive force that's basically vertical, that's even worse in these coordinates. And for fun, we generalize this thing to general potential functions that may or may not be grounded in microscopic physics. It doesn't matter. We just did a general analysis general polytrope equations of state. And we could show that you, in fact, never obtain a stable solution at the center of the galaxy that also has the desired scaling. So that puts some tension on whether or not these ultralight axions could really explain it. They can certainly fit one galaxy, but it's the trend amongst many galaxies that is very difficult to explain. Um, I don't know, should I stop there because I'm at five? or? Um, so, well, let's see. Maybe. Maybe like a middle or two, and then we can open up for questions. Okay. Okay, so I can just finish. I have other topics, but I can just essentially finish. So, one thing I have thought about recently, or the last few years, um, is you might say, well, what are these axion stars good for if they don't provide the solution of the core cusp problem? And this is an analysis that you can do, whether you're interested in the QCD axion with 10 to the minus 5 EV or lighter or heavier. And that is that, as I said, the axion couples should couple to this FF dual or E dot B term. It should couple to the photon, not just the gluon. And its coefficient here is related to 1 over F. So if you write down the modified Maxwell equations, modified Maxwell wave equation, it then looks like this. So here's the standard wave operator. And then there's a new coupling to the axion. So imagine you have an axion star, and this is its spatial profile. And there may, again, be huge numbers of these living in our galaxy today. So it's a field, and it's oscillating with a frequency set by the axion mass. Now, if you have a term like an oscillating term in the wave equation, under favorable conditions, it can produce parametric resonance into electromagnetic radiation. So this is something we looked into. You can solve the equations and find under what conditions that resonance can take place. And so it, naturally, it's very sensitive to the value of the axion-photon coupling. If the coupling is big enough, there is resonance. If it's small enough, it's not. It's literally zero. There's a kind of phase transition, if you like, from one regime to the other. And you can understand that physically as follows. If the coupling of the ax axion to the photon is too small, then as the axion tries to pair produce photons, they essentially leave the star too quickly. And then Bose-Einstein statistics becomes ineffective. But if the coupling is large enough, they pair produce so rapidly that they, the photons kind of sit on top of one another as they leave. And Bose statistics kicks in, and you get exponential growth. 
So this is an exponential rate here. And if you put in numbers, if you're here somewhere, the rate at which this thing would lose energy is on the scale of a fraction of a second. So you'd have a moon mass of energy beaming out in a fraction of a second. Not a beam, but, but a, um, uh, well, it's, it's, it's approximately spherically symmetric, uh, but it would be kind of like a laser nevertheless. The condition for resonance turns out to be that the coupling has to be bigger than 0.3 divided by the scale of new physics f that sets the coupling to the gluon, if you like, one way of defining it. And so for the stand, this minimal QCD axion models, this condition is actually not satisfied. Those are expected to be down by a factor of alpha, not 0.3, where alpha is the fine structure constant, 1 over 137. But it would be allowed in models with enhanced couplings these exist, or in the case where you have repulsive interactions, as Gigi found, in those cases this bound is relaxed. The stars can be much more heavy, and they act as better resonators. So let me just say something about this. If the condition, if we're lucky enough and the condition is satisfied, by the way, if it's not, these things will just live, and they should be here today. If the condition is satisfied, then maybe these stars just disappear, and in a fraction of a second. Except they're not all going to disappear. Because suppose in the early universe you populate this branch of solutions, heavy stars and light stars, some of which will be heavy enough that they can resonate. And in a fraction of a second, they lose a moon mass or so of energy. That means their number goes down as they lose mass. And then they will reach a critical point at which the resonance shuts off. So what you would get if you populate this area in the early universe is a mass pile up at a critical mass, which is dictated by fundamental constants, ultimately. Well, so much for the early universe. The fun happens, and that's it, right? Except you might hope that in our galaxy today, there's an occasional merger. These mergers would be rare, but they can happen. And the mergers of a pair of axion stars you can compute. And it's a merger not through the emission of gravitational waves, but th this is in the weak field regime, so that really doesn't happen much, but through the emission of scalar axion waves. So they lose a bit of energy, but the new mass is still bigger than the original masses less than their sum. There's interesting phase dependence on the mergers, but generically, a mergers happen. And so you can imagine a merger happening in the late universe, in the galaxy. Since there's a mass pile up, they would move, therefore, over the critical value, up here somewhere. And then they resonate. And in a fraction of a second, a moon's mass of energy comes out. So these would be late time mergers, and this is a kind of radio wave burst. Because if you ask what's the wavelength of the radiation, it's basically 4 pi divided by the axion mass. And if you take a, a, the most arguably favored value of the axion mass of 10 to the minus 5 electron volts, that's order a meter, a kind of radio wave. Tkachev has discussed related ideas and suggested these thing, related ideas may be related to the fast radio bursts that we observe. It's difficult to make that interpretation work, however, because these things should be highly monochromatic, whilst fast radio bursts are known to not be very monochromatic at all. But it's something interesting <laughs> to, to look at. OK, I think I will skip this business about some other quantum aspects of things and just conclude. So I've said that cosmological acceleration, let's go to this one, cosmological acceleration neutrino masses, reheating the universe, strong CP problem, and dark matter all indicate new physics beyond the standard model. Violating fundamental principles, locality, Poincaré, and quantum mechanics is difficult both experimentally and theoretically, though perhaps it's possible. Adding higher dimension operators and new degrees of freedom, that is to say new particles, looks very promising and would continue this historical success, this trend we've been on for 100 years. So very plausibly, a world of new particles may be out there, but many may be hidden. It's just life that may be the way it is. Can we discover them? If, if they have ridiculously tiny couplings, we may indeed have to exploit non-trivial astrophysical phenomena, perhaps of the form that I illustrated, at least one particular idea.
On the other hand, could dark energy or these potential problems, core cusp and Tully Fisher relation, demonstrate that the historical trend is not quite right and something fundamentally new is happening? So only time will tell. And let me uh, also thank the students and postdocs I've worked on and played a big role in many of these projects. And thank you for your attention. I mean, at this stage, we haven't done that analysis, but uh, hopefully there will be a brave enough student who might want to take that on at some point. <laughs> or if, if, if anyone else wants to work on that, please contact me. <laughs> to, to look. The time scale, um, let's see, I think I remember something we got 10 to the 4 seconds or something. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, if you're close enough that you can merge, it's quick. But almost always they miss. You have to appeal to the fact that there's a gigantic number of them in the galaxy for the chances that they will occasionally get close and merge. No, it's, it's almost, it's close to monochromatic. It's not perfectly monochromatic, of course, but it's close to. So that's why it's not obvious that you could explain fast radio burst this way, but uh, um, I, mean, I just mentioned it to cut you, I've had that point of view. So would you expect some sort of like uh, monochromatic, like some sort of diffuse background in radio waves, maybe, if you're like looking out far enough? Or is it, or is it a hard area not to frequently tell? I mean, again, of course, the, uh, the amplitude, of course, would fall off tremendously this way. So at, we did an analysis um, for the galaxy. Um, again, the, the, the merger is so rapid that I think you're really talking bursts, not like a stochastic background. I, don't th I think if you were to look along the line of sight, you would not find that there was a net effect of many of them that happen in every direction. So yeah, I don't think it would be like a stochastic background. Do you know roughly like what the luminosity is? What sort of flux you might expect? Um, well, it looked to be big enough to detect. That's right. I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but you can imagine a, a moon mass of a merger inside our galaxy, whatever that equates to. So you can do the division yourself. Moon mass divided by whatever, some thousands and thousands of kiloparsecs squared. But it, but it looked detectable. But yes, but the, the, the rate of mergers may be too, too, too rare. Yes? Hmm. Um, is that analysis done with a single axion? That's right. That was a single axion, yes. Have you considered that? Uh, yes, with multiple axions. Right. Yeah, multiple axions, yes. For example, with this student demo, we're looking at multiple axions in the second from the bottom left. Yes, that's, we're currently looking at that. Well, that, that's right. I mean, this, um, well, I guess it's also a 
partly a question of definition. This axion star is usually called a condensate, so maybe its perturbations are considered superfluidic, or, the, or would you not use that language? Um, I want, I'm curious to know what language you use. Um, yeah, I guess I would call it a superfluid, yeah. Sure. Is it not? Uh, <laughs> Okay, but this is a superfluid detector, sorry. It's a superfluid detector. Superfluid detector, yes. The stars themselves may also be superfluids, <laughs> but it, whether that's relevant or not, I don't know. It's one of those nice coincidences. Mm-hmm. Think about that. Axion is a composite. Um, I mean, are there microscopic models that do that? As the axion. Very light axions that can do that? I have to think about that. Sorry. <laughs> That's interesting. Thank you.